so what is the role within? I mean, I know what the role of a of chief marketing officer of a company is, but how about let's talk about within a company? And also, do you ever feel like you're sort of an internal CMO advocating for you know, what you do outside, but internally to get ideas to fruition? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, uh, I, I, it's been a big change in our company. I think we've tried to redefine the role of marketing. When you hear marketing, most people think um, we're the advertising people, and we do that. Um, but we also say there's a lot more we expect from marketing. So it's a lot of targeting products and getting them launched. Um, and it's a, we've, we've tried to make sure that marketing's been redefined as innovators. Mm -hmm. And so um, probably uh, another word for it in our company is instigators. Yeah. Um, try to get, get change going. But there's a huge role internally to pull the pieces together, to what we talk a lot about, connecting the dots. Mm -hmm. So from our marketers, we expect them to be sort of the champions of what's next. So to play that role of understanding where are the trend's going, then how do they come back and translate it in the company. And then they have to pull the pieces together. They have to get technology to work with operations, to work with sales. And so marketing pull, plays a couple of different roles. It's hard to be an instigator and the, one, the implementer that pulls it together. So a big part of it is helping um, paint a vision, creating the impetus and the energy that says the world's going this way, our customers are going this way, we got to be there, um, and then pulling, pulling the pieces together. So it's very much an external and an internal role. Hmm. Do you, um, with more urgent stuff than you, I'm sure you could possibly ever get done every day, you know, how do you ever advocate and make time for yourself to kind of push those sort of important, important but more long-term objectives forward? against yeah. kind of the gravitational force of everyday operations. I'm sure everyone here deals with this in a, in a big company like, like GE. I mean, you don't get to be a 130-year-old company without developing some kind of resilience and some ability to be nimble. So you certainly have to focus a lot about today, but you have to be prepared for tomorrow. And again, we expect our marketing and innovation teams to, to be the champions for that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's hard fighting for tomorrow. Um, and especially if you look at what we've all been through in the downturn, I think probably most every company um, things were, if, if not put on ice, they were slowed down. Um, and um, what's good, the good news is, is that when you orient everyone to say there is a tomorrow, you still have to keep things alive. Right. So I feel really good that in the downturn, we were able to keep things going. Mm -hmm. We were actually in some cases to keep investing in very substantial ways because you knew, one, your customers' needs were changing. So you had to, you had to one, figure out how they were changing because you knew they weren't going to be the same coming out of this. So there is a lot of fighting for tomorrow. Some of the very practical things we've done, um, I'd say the best thing that we've done is we've created a protected class of ideas. Hmm. And this runs across the whole company. The chairman of our company, Jeff Emelt, owns these ideas. We have about uh, 50 to 100 at any given time that are in his sort of stable. I run that for him. Um, and you know, there's a certain amount of attention that gets. That's not always wanted. People don't, don't, don't always like the fact, but they also like the fact that they, they have the attention. So, you, you know, you sort of set up to the company, and every business has this too. There's this protected class of ideas. When things get tough, we're still going to keep them going. So, we believe in tomorrow. So for all of us that may work in larger corporations and have an idea that we want to be one of those protected ideas, what can we do to advocate internally to get it on the radar of you or someone like Jeff? Yeah, well, it's a couple of things. I think uh, doing Skunk Works inside, I mean, I would say most of our teams have good Skunk Works capabilities. They uh -huh. don't talk about it before it's too early. Uh -huh. That's, and that's the tension. You know, I'm always like, give me the good ideas. And the business guys are always like, I'm not ready yet. And so, you know, you have to have a little success. You have to have done a pilot or you have to have some reason to believe beyond just, hey, I love this idea. Uh -huh. But not too much. Don't wait too long. It doesn't have to be perfect. I think you, you, know, you have to tell, I always say you have to tell a story before you can sell a story. So I think you have to be pretty clear in what the vision is and some nod of, ah, this is why I'm feeling confident about it. So I would say good storytelling and a bit of, um, a bit of experience and then just tons of passion. I, I guarantee you the people who are most passionate about it, even if it's the stupidest idea, yeah. even if it's the one that sounds craziest, the passion always wins the day. Huh. And I, I actually have learned and I think it is one of the filters we use. The more passionate someone is about something, the, the more you have to listen to them, right? Mm -hmm. and, and usually, it, I always use, it's, for me, it's been a filter in my career when, when I know I've been tested, and I try to do that with folks too. If this is really an idea you're going to fight for, 
then I've got the confidence this is going to happen, even if I don't quite understand it. Which sort of goes back to Jared's point about he just kind of goes in and advocates with extreme passion. And even if people have no idea what their role will be, they're just like, OK, I'm in. Just I'm, yeah. I'm convinced. And measure it with just a little bit of homework. Right. You know, just yeah. so, so that it's at least credible. <laughs> the legs that it needs. So here's another question. I mean, a lot of uh, the research now on innovation tells us it's all about rapid iteration and prototyping, and which ultimately means you have to try many things and fail many times before you actually find what succeeds. So in a large company like G that I'm sure has traditional ways of measuring people and failure is probably not tolerated you know, in, or celebrated in a large company, how do you kind of uh, you know, allow or drive innovation and deal with failure at GE? Yeah, uh, I'd love to tell you we're like failure role models that we <laughs> fail successfully and promote it. It's hard. It's really hard. Um, for us, I'd say the constant tension with a company like ours Great. When you're a big company, you, you want to scale, right? Yeah. I mean, it's all about scale. You need scale. So there's certain innovations that, frankly, just aren't going to be big enough. And so there, there's, a, you know, there's a, a benchmark, if you will, of what failure means. Uh, maybe it's a great idea. It's just not going to be big enough. Mm -hmm. um, this idea of fail fast, fail small, it's a great rallying cry. We talk about it, but it's really hard. I'd love to tell you we're great at it. We're not. Um, oftentimes, I'd say for us, it's been a couple things, making heroes out of some of the failures, because the hero part comes in like, because you didn't do this, you can now, we've had all this learning that we can now apply somewhere else. So, you know, appliances, there was a whole line of appliances. I was part of this project and it didn't work well. And it was, we were able to take that team and say, because it didn't work, launching, it was a new kind of micro unit. And, and because it didn't work, they saved us this amount of energy. The technology that they have is now applied to this product line. So I think making those heroes, and I would say also just changing the dialogue. Mm -hmm. So what does failure mean? We love process in our company, yeah. Six Sigma rigor. And you know, you might think that's at odds with creativity and iteration. And the fact is they both coexist. Creativity needs a process. Mm -hmm. You need checkpoints, you need toll gates. Um, but changing those toll gates into did you pass or did you fail to different kinds of questions. What did you learn? That, that's a key question. What did you learn, yeah. not what did you do? Yep. Um, and so I think it's been that kind of change. But um, <clears throat> even in trying to come up with some fun ideas to share here, I put out a call up to our whole innovation community. And I was surprised at how few people volunteered to share their failures. So I think that's an ongoing challenge we all have. Yeah, I know, I'm sure. Uh, so another, another you know, unrelated question, but I know you're on the board of the <coughs> Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum. You've always been a real advocate for design. And um, how do you advocate for design within a company that really, you know, a lot of the power lies with the business leaders and also the uh, engineers? I mean, any sort of tips or thoughts you can share on your, you know, history in advocating for design at GE? Yeah, I mean, we're a company, we've got about 45,000 engineers and we have about 3,000 researchers and about 5,000 marketers. So it gives you a sense of scale. So engineers rule. Um, and um, I love engineers. They power our company. But they love technology so much, they believe it virtually could operate itself, it sells itself, it markets itself. And so, you know, part of the challenge has been getting design embedded to say a couple of things. Design is all about usability. And so you have this great technology, but if no one can access it or use it, um, it's a real challenge. It's about targeting the technology. A lot of work we're doing, what you call reverse innovation, but how do you take the best technology and target it so that it's perfect for a tier three hospital, a neonatal unit that costs $5,000, not $35,000 in India? Hmm. How do you take that? And so design needs to make that happen. And I would say the last thing, and I think this is just emerging in our company. I don't know how other folks are dealing with it, but we're a technology company that solves big problems. You're big, you focus on big problems, clean tech, health. It's all about designing your way to solve problems. It's not the product, it's designed for problem solving. Mm -hmm. And so you need designers who can really help figure out how do you connect those dots, what's the big ecosystem. Um, the big issue we're working on right now is electric vehicles. OK, we've got lots of great products, but you need a designer who can design from the experience to the system to all the partners that come together. So I really do think design's um, place in business is really just starting. And I think engineering technology companies often imagine, I love designers, but imagine designers showing up in their beret and you know it's right. kind of like art and they don't quite get it and it's beautiful. But I think we need to understand that they, them to understand that this is really about redesigning business mm -hmm. and it's about connecting them more to the customers. And so I think that's where, that's where it's all heading. I'm very excited about that. 
We only have a couple more minutes, so uh, just two more questions if you can fit it. Uh, you know, one is, uh, so you once said this quote, instigators needed but not always welcomed, and it's actually a quote that we pulled for our, the 99% program. What did you mean by that? Well, I mean, everybody says they want change. Everybody says they want someone in there to advocate for a new way. But anyone who's had that job knows that you really aren't very welcomed. Mm -hmm. um, and um, people say they want it. What I've learned is that, uh, myself included, if you're a change agent, usually you mean you want someone else to change, not yourself. And so instigators are important in a company because they have to agitate for a new way. You're an irritant. You're a pain in the whatever, right? I mean, there's a whole host of other words that I'm sure are not as nice. And um, I, I think it's really hard. It takes a really special leader that understands the role of the instigator, that protects them. I know there have been decisions I've been protected in. Um, and I see our best instigators having someone who protects them and gives them the air cover. But at the same time, the instigator has to be practical. They have to figure out a way to make it happen. You know, Jared talked about it earlier. I, I totally agree with that. But it's very hard. Just uh, an FYI, we've actually studied instigators in our company in the role of innovation, they have the shortest lifespan hmm. of any kind of uh, characteristic. Um, and that's no surprise. So they usually have a lot of uh, scratch marks, <laughs> scratch on, their marks back, on their back too as they're walking out the door. Well, and then I guess, um, I guess we need to muster the courage to be that instigator and, uh, and to advocate for it. And do you ever find yourself, because now in your, in your senior role, you probably also find yourself not also being, only being the instigator sometimes, but sort of being the person who's like, oh, that pain in the ass. You know, they're, can they just go away? You know, what do you do when th change is now thrust upon you? It's hard. I mean, it really is hard. And that's why it's much easier to be the one a uh, advocating for change than having change done on you. And I think maybe the awareness is one of the things I've had to deal with. I was uh, shipped off to an assignment at NBC about five years ago. And it was all about change. And I was all leading change. But I had to change a lot. And mm -hmm. you know, you sort of wake up one day and you go, wait a minute. Am I doing all I can be to be successful? Maybe there's something I have to change about the way I approach it. And so I think that kind of, um, why is it important to change? And what's my role? How am I going to be most effective? And sometimes instigators, it's like I just see, the, I see that goal, and I'm going to get it. And you know what? You've got to understand how you can do it successfully. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much for the candid conversation Thank for you. joining us today. Thanks for having Thanks. me. Thanks a lot.